Welcome to this message by Ray Steadman titled, The Lord and His Workmen, from RaySteadman.org. The text for this message is from Jeremiah chapter 11 through 15. I want to begin this fourth study in the prophecy of Jeremiah with a little uh, quotation that uh, was used this last week at Dallas of a, an advertisement for a minister because I think it, has to do, it, it touches upon the preparation that's needed for God's man in God's age. This is the ad. Wanted a minister for a growing church. A real challenge for the right man. Opportunity to become better acquainted with people. Applicant must offer experience as shop worker, office manager, educator, all levels including college, artist, salesman, diplomat, writer, theologian, politician, boy scout leader, <laughs> children's worker, minor league athlete, psychologist, vocational counselor, psychiatrist, funeral director, <laughs> wedding consultant, master of ceremonies, circus clown, <laughs> missionary, social worker, helpful but not essential, experience as a butcher, baker and cowboy, and Western Union messenger. Must know all about the problems of birth, marriage, and death, also conversant with latest theories and practices in areas like pediatrics, economics, and nuclear science. <laughs> right man will hold firm views on every topic, but is careful not to upset people who disagree. <laughs> Must be forthright, but flexible. Returns criticism and backbiting with Christian love and forgiveness. Should have outgoing, friendly disposition at all times, should be captivating speaker and intent listener. Will pretend he enjoys hearing women talk. <laughs> Directly responsible for views and con conduct to all church members and visitors. Not confined to direction or support from any one person. Salary not commensurate with experience or need. No overtime pay. All replies kept confidential. Anyone applying will undergo full investigation to determine his sanity. <laughs> now that's uh, what perhaps is needed in the ministry today. And I think we ought to set that against the biblical truth that is rapidly coming back into focus today that all of us are in the ministry. All God's people are ministers, wherever they are. In according to the gifts God has given you, you're a ministry, a minister, and in the ministry. And as we come to this study of Jeremiah, we're looking at the story of the last days of a nation, the nation Judah, the death of a nation. And there's a great many lessons to learn from this and the in what happened to Judah. But perhaps I think the central lesson of this book is what happened to Jeremiah as God prepared him to minister in a day of decay. He was called to a strange and difficult ministry and God gradually had to prepare him and toughen him for the assignments he was given increasingly in this, in this nation. And as we saw last week, Jeremiah struggled with his commission. He wept over it. He pleaded with God for this people. And the more he wept and the more he pleaded, the more God seemed to grow harder and more adamant and more determined to judge. Well, it's now 13 years later after the message we saw last week. And we've come to the time when King Josiah has died. Remember, King Josiah was a godly king, the last godly king in Judah. He had made a valiant effort to try to reform the nation and to overcome the idols, the idol worship of that, that nation, and to restore the worship of Jehovah. And outwardly, the people had gone along with him, but inwardly, there was still deep-seated rebellion and revolt. 
And at last, Josiah met his death as in the account as we heard it read this morning when oh, disobeying the word of God he went out to do battle with the king of Egypt who was on his way to the great battle of Carchemish one of the historic battles of all time and there in the plain of Megiddo where the last great battle of all ages the battle of Armageddon will be fought King Josiah met his death and was mourned in Israel. And Jeremiah the prophet made a lamentation for him, which is recorded in the book of Lamentations. And uh, Jeremiah was plunged into an even more difficult time he'd ever known before. The young son of, of Josiah came to the throne, throne Jehoahaz, or Jehoahaz. But he was a very weak king, and within three months he had been deposed by the king of, ba of, uh, of Egypt. And his brother, Jehoiakim, was placed upon the throne. This was a troubled time in the nation. Around it, the great powers of earth, the superpowers of that day, were, were vying and contending with one another for supremacy in the affairs of the world. Egypt was on its way down. Assyria was melting away. The power of Babylon was looming on the horizon. It was a world of unrest and of great uh, turmoil. And in between was Judah, caught in the jaws of a nutcracker, between the great superpowers of that day. Now in chapter 11, where we begin today, God sends young Jeremiah back to the nation with another word of warning and denunciation. We'll not take time to read it because it's very similar to the messages that Jeremiah had, deliver, had to de deliver repeatedly to these people. A warning that God would not allow them to get away with their unbelief and their revolt and their vileness and their worship of other gods. And how he was determined to judge them. And once again in this account, for the third time now in Jeremiah's ministry, God tells him not to pray for this nation. 11.14 Therefore do not pray for this people, or lift up a cry or prayer on their behalf, for I will not listen when they call to me in the time of their trouble. That was what had distressed Jeremiah so much in our last study together, and God wouldn't even let him pray for them. He laid a vocal quarantine on him and said, I don't even want you to pray because prayer delays judgment. And all this had great effect upon Jeremiah. And what we are going to see today is God's toughening of this young man, preparation for the things that were coming. Jeremiah was, uh, was moved and distressed by God's failure to, to listen to him. But what was worse, this account tells us that when he went home to, his little, to the little town of Anathoth, which was just outside the city limits of Jerusalem, not very far away, just a little tiny suburb, just a little obscure, dingling sort of place, uh, it was there that uh, that God uh, that Jeremiah found something was happening that absolutely threw him into consternation. There he learned that there was a plot against his life by his own neighbors and friends. He tells us about it in verse eighteen. The Lord made it known to me, and I knew. Then thou didst show me their evil deeds. But I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. He suddenly realizes how naive and blind he'd been, trusting these neighbors and friends in this little town, and now they were. he learned they had plotted against his life. I did not know it was against me they devised schemes, saying, Let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name be remembered no more. And Jeremiah was dismayed at this, that his friends would betray him in this way and refuse to support him. And he comes to the Lord and cries out, But, O Lord of hosts, 
who judges righteously, who triest the heart and the mind. Let me see thy vengeance upon them, for to thee have I committed my cause. Now he did the right thing. He brought his problem to the Lord. Some of us don't bother to do that when trial strikes. We run to somebody else, but he brought it to the Lord. But he was a thoroughgoing evangelical because he had, he, though he brought his problem to the Lord, he had with it also a complete plan for how God ought to solve it. <laughs> he wanted him to, to wreak vengeance upon these who were threatening him. And uh, he expected God to do it. But the Lord said to him, Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the men of Anathoth who seek thy life and say, Do not prophesy in the name of the Lord, or you will die by our hand. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will punish them. The young men shall die by the sword, their sons and their daughters shall die by famine, and none of them shall be left, for I will bring evil upon the men of Anathoth the year of their punishment. Now God says to Jeremiah, yeah, You're right. I will punish these men, but I'll do it in my time. They're going to have a part in the judgment that's coming upon Israel, upon Judah. They shall, they shall suffer in the famine and the attack that's coming from Babylon. But it will be when I say. You know, that's one of the hard things about dealing with God, isn't it? He has his own time schedule. We want him to act now. We say, Lord, look at the opportunity you've got. It's all set up. Now, if you just do this now, everything would work out. And God ignores us and says, I'll do it in my own time. And that was one of the hard things that Jeremiah had to learn, as it is with every one of us, that God does not move on our time schedule, much as we'd like him to do. Now, Jeremiah goes on to... Uh, to uh, present his case before the Lord. And uh, he says, Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I complain to you. I know that you're right, Lord. I know that you cannot do wrong and that what you're doing is right. And this, by the way, is a great lesson to learn. For we're sometimes tempted to say, God is not right, he's wrong. And Jeremiah began this way. And yet there were great and vexing questions that came up into his troubled heart, and he shares them. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? How long will the land mourn and the grass of every field wither? And he cries out to God with these troubled questions in his mind. Now, as you recognize, those are the standard questions men ask when uh, things begin to go wrong even in, in an individual life or in the life of a community or a nation. I was in just in Fort Worth this last week and on Thursday night teaching a, cl a Bible class in a large home there. And there were a lot of young, uh, young life kids there and I noticed they seemed rather sober, more than usual, far more than usual. And um, <laughs> I, uh, I asked what was wrong. I found out that Fort Worth was going through a similar predicament as we are here in the kidnapping of the Hearst daughter, that a very well-liked and well-known high school girl in that city had, been, uh, had disappeared mysteriously a few days before, and no one knew where she was. And all her high school friends were praying for her. She was a Christian, and they were sure that God would protect her, and they were spending time and praying for her. And just an hour before the class met that night, Thursday night of last week, word had, been, had come over the radio that her body had been found. And she had been sexually assaulted and abused and, and killed. And these young people were stunned. They were asking this question, why? If there's a God of love and power... Why couldn't he have done something about that? If he's a God of power, he could act. If he's a God of love, he'd want to act. Why does he sit there and let things like this happen? 
Now that's one of the great questions thrown at our faith again and again in this day and age. And this is what Jeremiah was crying out to God about. Now notice God's response. It's very interesting. In verse 5 of chapter 12. If you have raced with men on foot and they have wearied you, how will you compete with horses? And if in a safe land you fall down, how will you do in the jungle of the Jordan? In other words, Jeremiah, what are you going to do when it gets worse? If these kind of things throw you, if your faith is challenged and you're upset and you cry out to me and ask these questions, what are you going to do when it gets very much worse? There where are you going to turn? What are you going to stand on then? If you've been running with the footmen and, they, and you got tired with them, what are you going to do when you have to run against horses? And if running through the open prairie you fall down, what are you going to do when you have to struggle through a hot, sweaty jungle with growth, thick growth that impedes your progress in every way? These are searching questions, aren't they? One of the chilling things that we learned this week in Dallas, listening to Hal Lindsay and also Ed Plowman. Hal, you all know, Ed Plowman is one of the editors of Christianity Today, and he gave a very remarkable report of some of the things that are happening in the world today, right in our own day, as did Hal, who gave a, a very frightening report on the rise of the occult and the way all the demonism and Satanism is moving into every level of life in our country today. And they talked about the famines that are already beginning as the prophets of gloom and doom, as they were called a few years ago, had predicted. Now already a great famine is raging across the southern part of Africa, uh, the central part of Africa, as the Sahara Desert steadily and for no reason known to man moves southward at the rate of 11 miles a year. And thousands of people are starving to death in the Sudan right now. And uh, these strange things are happening in our world. And they talked about how Jesus had said that as we neared the end, there would come earthquakes and famines and, and wars rising up against nation and frightening things in the sea, the roaring of the waves would make men afraid. And he called this all the beginnings of sorrows, just the beginnings of sorrow. Now, if faith grows cold and faint and weak in the midst of the pressures of today, God's question to Jeremiah and to us is, what are you going to do when it gets worse? How will you compete with horses if you're, you give in when you're running against just men? Well, Jeremiah expected God to lift the burden. I think most of us uh, are, are due a shock in our Christian life when we reach that stage in Christian development when we expect God to just constantly work out our problems on easy terms. And then one day he doesn't do it. One day he doesn't, doesn't work it out, doesn't change it. That is always a shocking time to us. But that's where Jeremiah is right here. And God doesn't say, I'll, I'll work out your problems. Don't worry, Jeremiah, I'll take care of everything. You won't have any more strain. Go right back to work. He says, Jeremiah, it's going to get worse. Just a lot worse. What are you going to do then? Then he begins to detail for him some of the things. In fact, one of the first things he'd find when he got home, if he was disturbed by the fact that his friends and his neighbors had betrayed him and were plotting his life, God says, verse 6, For even your brothers and the house of your father, even they have dealt treacherously with you. They are in full cry after you. Believe them not, though they speak fair words to you. Your own family is part of the plot. Now, what do you think that did to Jeremiah when God said this to him? 
And furthermore, he went on to point out that the judgment was absolutely inevitable for this nation. Nothing Jeremiah could do would stop it. God says, I have forsaken my house. I have abandoned my heritage. I have given the beloved of my soul into the hands of her enemies. My heritage has become to me like a lion in the forest. She has lifted up her voice against me. Therefore, I hate her. Now that's God speaking. I hate her. What does that do to your theology? God of love says I hate her. The beloved of my soul, I hate her. What kind of confusing contrast is this? Now, I know you have to set this against what uh, theologians call the anthropomorphisms of Scripture. That is, God speaking in terms of a man as though he were a man. For it's true that the inherent nature of God is love. And he can never be anything but a God of love. And yet, love can be so offended and rejected that it acts as though it hates. And that's what Jeremiah was facing here. And God goes on to describe what he's going to do in the land and how he will deliver it. But there's a word of light, a, a ray of light in verse 14. Thus says the Lord concerning all my evil neighbors who touch the heritage which I have given my people Israel to inherit, Behold, I will pluck them up from their land, and I will pluck up the house of Judah from among them. But after I have plucked them up, I will again have compassion on them, and I will bring them again each to his heritage and each to his land. The final message of God is not one of hate. It's always one of love, always one of compassion. But in between, there are strange actions of God. And we have to face the fact that God sometimes does things that we cannot understand at the moment at all. This is one of the great challenging things of the Christian faith. And one of the great tests of our faith is when you reach that day when you can no longer understand what God is doing. It doesn't seem to be in line with his promises at all. You have to stand like Paul and say, Who has known the mind of the Lord? And who has been his counselor? Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Well, God's not through with Jeremiah. And in the next chapter is one of those amazing visual aids that God's emplo God employs to teach this young prophet a great and marvelous truth. And I never get over being astonished at the, at the objects God uses to teach lessons. For here, Jeremiah in chapter 13 is given a sign, and we'll have to call it the sign of the dirty shorts. <laughs> really. For believe it or not, he says, Thus said the Lord to me, Go and buy a linen waist cloth and put it on your loins. Now that's nothing more nor less than a pair of shorts. Linen shorts. And do not dip it in water. If any of you men have been buying underwear recently, you know that you always look for the wash and wear variety. At least I do. But here's one that God said, You wear it, but don't wash it. He, expect, he, he expected Jeremiah to buy a new pair of linen shorts and put them on and not wash them. And uh, he was teaching him something from this. Well, what in the world would God be teaching by this? Well, if you skip on ahead for a moment to verse 11, you'll see what he's after. For as the waist cloth clings to the loins of a man... So I made the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah cling to me, says the Lord, that they might be for me a people, a name, a praise, and a glory. But they would not listen. In other words, God chose them, designed them for intimacy. 
A pair of shorts is the most intimate garment a man can wear. And God uses that as a figure here, a wonderful figure to instruct us. But that's what he designs his people for, to be as intimate to him as a pair of shorts are. I remember an advertisement that uh, used uh, put out by an underwear company some years ago. You don't see it very often anymore. It said, next to yourself, you'll love BVDs. <laughs> and that's what God is saying here. Next to himself, closest to himself, the most intimate relationship possible. He wants for his people in order that they might be a name, a praise, a glory unto him, uh, a people for his name. And yet they would not listen. And so he's teaching Jeremiah how much this people meant to him and what he had designed for them and the, the, the glory that was, possibly, that was possible to them in the intimacy of a relationship with God. But now Jeremiah was sent uh, to do something with these shorts. We read uh, verse 3 or 2. So I bought a waist cloth according to the word of the Lord and put it on my loin. We don't know how long he wore it, but it evidently got quite dirty because he was forbidden to wash it. And then the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to me a second time, Take the waist cloth which you have bought, which is upon your loins, and arise and go to the Euphrates, and hide it there in a cleft of the rock. Now the Euphrates River was a journey of about 200 miles away. It was on the borderline of Babylon. And God is saying something about the nation that would come to, to uh, bring judgment upon this people here. But, God, but Jeremiah had to travel 200 miles to the Euphrates River with his dirty shorts and hide them in a cleft of the rock and leave them there. Come back into Israel 200 miles again. And then he tells us, After many days, the Lord said to me, Arise, go to the Euphrates, and take from there the waist cloth which I commanded you to hide there. Then I went to the Euphrates and dug, and I took the waist cloth from the place where I had hidden it, and behold, the waist cloth was spoiled. It was good for nothing. Now you can imagine what shape it was in. It was already soiled and dirty when Jeremiah hid it there. Exposed to the element, the rain, the wind, the sun, the cloth would rot and shred. And finally, when Jeremiah came back and dug it out of the cleft of the rock, there it was, dirty, rotting, shredding, hardly able to hold together, worthless. And standing there with those worthless shorts in his hand, he tells us, Then the word of the Lord came to me. Thus says the Lord, Even so will I spoil the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. This evil people who refuse to hear my words, who stubbornly follow their own heart and have gone after other gods to serve them and worship them shall be like this waste cloth, which is good for nothing. And Jeremiah was taught what happens to a life, how a life begins to rot that turns away from God. Can it be sustained in its strength? God is the source of all strength in humanity. Man cannot be man apart from God. And any individual and any nation that refuses to, to live on that basis will find his life beginning to, to rot and to shred and to lose its consistency and its power. And he will be as this, good for nothing. Well, the rest of the chapter goes on to show how moved and stirred Jeremiah is with this. He pleads with the people. Verse 15, Hear and give ear. Be not proud, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God before he brings darkness, before your feet stumble on the twilight mountains. And while you look for light, he turns it into gloom and makes it deep darkness. But if you will not listen, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. See the effect upon Jeremiah? 
of his ministry here. And uh, then, to make it worse, God sends a severe drought upon the land. Chapter 14 opens with that. The word of the Lord which came to Jeremiah concerning the drought. And he goes on to describe the land, how the cisterns have no water, ground is dismayed, there's no rain on the land, the crops are dried up, the wild asses stand and pant, and uh, there's no water in all of the land. This is part of the judging hand of God. And once again, this arouses uh, questions in Jeremiah's heart. He asks them, Though our iniquities testify against us, Act, O Lord, for thy name's sake. See what he's saying now? I understand that you have to judge this people because of their wickedness, Lord, but what about you? You're the healer. You're the God who can restore wicked people. For your name's sake, do this. He says, Our backslidings are many. We have sinned against thee. But, O thou hope of Israel, its Savior in time of trouble, why should... Thou be like a stranger in the land, like a wayfarer who turns aside to tarry for a night. Why shouldst thou be like a man confused, like a mighty man who cannot save? For thou art Lord in the midst of us, and we are called by thy name. Leave us not. You ever come to that place? Many a man of God has turned away the judging hand of God in the record of the scriptures by pleading the glory of God himself. Moses had, Samuel had, others had stood before God and said, regardless of what we're like, God, remember what you're like. Surely for your own name's sake you won't let this thing happen, lest your name be defiled among the nation. And this is Jeremiah's cry. Now that's great praying. Jeremiah is reaching out to God on the highest level of prayer possible. And... uh, he, he calls to God in these terms, and he closes the chapter with a, an eloquent pleading with God. Listen to these words, verse 19. Hast thou utterly rejected Judah? Does thy soul loathe Zion? Why hast thou smitten us so that there's no healing for us? We looked for peace, but no good came. For a time of healing, but behold, terror We acknowledge our wickedness, O Lord, and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against thee. Do not spurn us for thy name's sake. Do not dishonor thy glorious throne. Remember and do not break thy covenant with us. Are there any among the false gods of the nations that can bring rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Art thou not he, O Lord our God? We set our hope on thee, for thou doest all these things. That's great praying. But listen to God's answer. Then the Lord said to me, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my heart would not turn toward this people. Send them out of my sight. Let them go. And when they ask you, Where shall we go? You shall say to them, Thus saith the Lord, Those who are for pestilence to pestilence. And those who are for the sword, to the sword. And those who are for famine, to famine. And those who are for captivity, to captivity. God doesn't budge an inch. Now what are you going to do with a God like that? When God gets that immovable, it's a great threat to faith, isn't it? What do you do? Well, God's not through yet with Jeremiah. And though he seems to be adamant and harsh and unyielding and goes on to repeat his threats to the nation, we won't take time to read it, and refuses to move, he has something yet to say. And the chapter 15 uh, closes with Jeremiah finally praying for himself. Lord, you won't let me pray for the people? He's again been forbidden to do so. God won't let him pray for the people. And so he cries out for himself. Verse uh, 15. O Lord, thou knowest, remember me and visit me and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. 
in thy forbearance, take me not away. Know that for thy sake I bear reproach. And then he thinks back of the days when the word of God was found in the temple in Josiah's day. And he says, thy words were found and I ate them and thy words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. But he's wretched, hurting, hurting, despairing. And he cries out in verse 18, why is my pain unceasing? my wound uncurable, refusing to be healed. Wilt thou be to me like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail? Those are the words of a man about to lose his faith entirely. He says, God seems to just pay no attention, give no heed, turn a deaf ear. I cry out to him, and I'm on the very verge of wondering if God himself is a liar and that he will prove false in the end. Have you been to that stage yet? Have you ever done like that? I'll tell you, that's a great test of faith. And one of these days, if you haven't, you may stand where Jeremiah stood. But now notice how tenderly and gently God deals with him. Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you will return, I will restore you. And you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall be as my mouth. They shall turn to you, but you shall not turn to them. And I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail over you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, says the Lord. I'll deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. God answers his own questions here. He had said to Jeremiah, what will you do if you've been running with a footman? What will you do when you contend with horses? And if in the safe land you fall down, what will you do in the jungle of the Jordan? Now his answer is, Jeremiah, if in even those hours when everything else seems collapsing and nothing seems to be dependable, if in that hour you'll rest on me, you'll find I'll strengthen you and see you through. I am the only adequate source of strength in any time of trouble. Any other source of dependence will fail you. The arm of flesh will fail. But when through the deep waters I call you to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. When through fiery pathway, uh, fiery trials, your pathway shall lie, I'll never, never leave you, God promises. And the promise is to us in this day as well. So God pours on the pressure sometimes, as you see with Jeremiah, not to destroy us, but to toughen us, to make us ready for what's coming. And I think this is a, just such an hour in American history today. Trials such as this nation has never faced by before. Shortages, famines, burdens, problems, we've never known as a people lie ahead of it. Surely nothing is adequate to it but the strength of the living God.
Things complete 